Well, that really says it. I don't have to add too much except to say that this is mostly what I remember, so that some of the history may be a little bit skewed. But, and I had, I had to have a couple of friends fill in some of the words that I didn't remember. There it goes. There it goes. Two events in the 1930s changed the way I looked at the world forever and determined my attitudes towards World War II. In 1936, I was nine years old. I was still reading the newspaper on the floor on my hands and knees. And I was reading Ernest Hemingway's Dispatches from Spain. And that made me, at the age of nine, a staunch partisan of the Spanish Republicans. Then, when the Nazis began their terror bombing of innocent civilians at Guernica, the capital of the Basque country, that made me into an anti-Nazi as well. In 1938, and the, I remember the exact date, it was November 10th, I was visiting my maternal grandparents, the Lubies. They took me with them to a gathering of their friends. And at 6 o'clock, of course, somebody turned on the radio to hear the news. This was part of life in those days. Everybody turned on the news at 6 o'clock. And it wasn't Gabriel Heater saying, there's good news tonight. It wasn't Walter Winchell saying, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. North of South America, and all the ships at sea. It was a remote. It wasn't coming from a studio. And the announcer was excited. He was saying, mobs are breaking the windows of Jewish shops. Brown shirts, Nazi stormtroopers, are going up the steps of apartment houses and dragging Jewish men out of their apartments, beating them on the streets, thrusting them into motor lorries, and carting them away. I was with my grandparents at a gathering of their friends, all Eastern European Jews. Most of them with personal experience of pogroms, and I looked around, and not one person was looking at me. And I felt that they were doing that purposely. They were trying to protect me. But I knew what pogroms were. I had learned about them at my grandfather's knee. And this was a pogrom. The reporter was probably William L. Shirer. The war started on September 1st, 1939. Poland was invaded by the Nazis, and the Poles responded with drawn saber horse cavalry charges against the tanks. Well, Britain had a pact, a mutual aid pact with Poland, as did France, and they went to Poland's rescue. The British sent an expeditionary force, and as they marched to the ships, they sang, we're gonna hang our washing on the Siegfried Line, if the Siegfried Line's still there. They also sang another song, which had just been written recently. Sing along with me on these. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. We'll follow through, just like you used to do. And your smiles will chase those dark clouds far away. Oh, won't you please say hello to the friends?
friends that I know, tell them I won't be long. They'll be happy to know that as you saw me go, I was singing this song. We'll meet again, don't go where, don't go when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny This is London. The lights are going out in chancelleries all over Europe. When the lights go on again, all over the world. Well, <laughs> you know the rest of it, I don't. <laughs> Well, the French dug in in the Maginot Line, and of course, the German tanks just ran around them. And it wasn't long before the remains of the British Expeditionary Force found themselves on the beach at Dunkirk. And the mighty British Navy were scattered all over the world. And there were not enough ships to bring the boys back. So they sent out a call. And every one, every civilian who had a, a fishing trawl or a sport fishing boat, uh, lifeboats for God's sake, went across the channel and brought the boys home. It was one of the most inspiring examples of national will and determination. There'll always be an England, and England shall be free. If England means as much to you as England means to me. But perhaps the best expression of hope and purpose is this. English song. There'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Tomorrow, just you wait and see. There'll be Tin helmets, 
and they still called them doughboys. You know for how long we called them doughboys? That comes from the Mexican War of 1849, when the clay of the adobe houses rubbed off and got their uniforms all white and yellow. So they called them adobe boys. <laughs> Johnny Doughboy found a rose in Ireland. Twas the sweetest rose that Erin ever knew. And the blarney in her talk took him back to old New York, where his mother spoke the sweetest blarney to And at the end of 1940, the United States instituted a draft. Goodbye, dear, I'll be back in a year, cause I'm in the army now. Back in a year. On December 4th, December 7th, 1941, again, I was with my maternal grandparents. The whole family was there. And of course, Grandpa turned on the radio at 6 o'clock. And we heard about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. This time, everyone turned around and looked at me. I was the oldest grandson. I knew what they were thinking. Would Joe have to go? The next morning, I went to school. I was a freshman at Olney High School in Philadelphia. They crammed everybody into the auditorium. The stage crew had hooked up a loudspeaker to the radio. And we heard President Roosevelt make his Day of Infamy speech. And no sooner had he asked the Congress to declare that a state of war existed between the United States of America and the Empire of Japan than the most dramatic thing I have ever witnessed happened. The entire senior class of boys stood up, walked out, and marched down to enlist. Well, Tim Pan Alley went to work. Goodbye, Mama, we're off to Yokohama. Oh, God. <laughs> well, they came close to having a hit when they wrote. Let's remember Pearl Harbor as we go to meet the foe. Let's remember Pearl Harbor as we did the Alamo. We will always remember how they died for liberty. Let's remember Pearl Harbor and go on to victory. We were in retreat all over the Pacific. Our boys in Bataan surrendered and were led on a death march. And their slogan was, we are the battling bastards of Bataan. No mom, no pop, no Uncle Sam. Well, showbiz organized to entertain the troops. USO units went to camps, foreign bases, Al Jolson, Bob Hope, Jerry Colonna, Francis Langford, Marlena Dietrich. In Hollywood, you had the Hollywood Canteen, where the boys could dance with starlets. And on Broadway, I left my heart at the stage door canteen. I left it there with a girl named Eileen. I sat the Dunkin' Donuts till all she had were gone. I sat the Dunkin' Donuts till she caught on. I must go back to that army. Strikes on him from the start. 
for the Navy, let this be our goal. We must be vigilant, we must be vigilant, American patrol, protect our shoreline to the doorline, love every native soul. Well, the men were away, so women worked on the production line. The symbol was Rosie the Riveter. And this song came out. Milkman, keep those bottles quiet. Can't use that job on my milk diet. Working on the swing ship all night. Turning out those bombers all right. You remember the way milk was delivered in those days? You heard the clop, clop, clop of the horses. We came out and smelled the souvenirs the horses left us. And the clanking of the bottles as the milkman came up to leave your Two bottles, not homogenous yet in those days. And a lot of men who were old enough, young enough to be drafted, but who had families, got extra jobs working in defense industries so they could be deferred. So that a lot of men were working at Bud's, doing sheet metal work, turning out the fuselages of airplanes. And sheet metal work is very dangerous. It's very easy to get cut. And the joke in those days was, I work at Bud's. <laughs> Organized labor pitched in to do their part. Pete Seeger, Woody Guthrie, Bess and Butch Hawes made up this song. I was standing round in defense town one day when I thought I overheard a soldier say every tank and plane and camp carries that UAW stamp. I'm UAW here, I'm proud to say. Well, it's that UAW CIO makes the army roll and go, turning out those jeeps and tanks, airplanes every day. It's that UAW CIO makes the army roll and go, puts wheels on the USA. There'll be a union meeting in Berlin when those union boys in uniform march in and rolling in the ranks there'll be UAW tanks roll Hitler out and roll the Union in one day I was home and I heard a hum and it got louder and louder and though finally it got so loud it seemed to be directly overhead I ran out of the streets and all the neighbors were out in the streets were all looking up in the sky and the sky was black with military airplanes. And we said, oh my God, there are Roosevelt's 50,000 planes. And in our fevered imaginations, they were taking that long hop across to Europe. Well, the war had to be financed. Defense bonds turned into war bonds. At school, if we couldn't afford the $18.75 it took to buy a bond which would mature in 10 years to $25, you got a book and you bought stamps for 10 cents a piece until you filled it up. And the school district of Philadelphia took those bonds, took that money, and bought a bomber. The weather's fine for flying. The fog has gone to bed with such good visibility. You can see victory ahead. We'll fill the air with eagles. We'll fill the skies with men. And you will see a land that's 
free when we fly home again. Well, the government was very busy trying to find things for us on the home front to do so that we felt that we were part of the war effort. And one of the things they had the housewives do was to collect fat. If you fried something, every housewife had a tin can on the stove, and you emptied the fats into the can. When it was full, you took it to the butcher shop. And the story was, the joke in those days was, that the butchers had a sign which said, Ladies, bring us your fat cans. <laughs> and the delicatessens had a sign that said, send a salami to your boy in the army. <laughs> well, perhaps the largest category of songs in those years was of longing for the boys who had gone away. Vera Lynn sang, We'll Meet Again, Gracie Fields, dear Gracie Fields, spent most of the war over here, and she was on the radio two or three times a week, and she sang, now is the Till then, 
when all the world will be free, please wait till then. Harold Arlen wrote and Joe Stafford sang, I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through. In that small cafe, the park across the way, the children's carousel, the chestnut tree, the
Well, with so many boys away, there was an old story which had a new name. The young lady was left without a boyfriend. She returned to the boys who were available. And of course, she felt she had to write and inform her boyfriend who was overseas about what happened. And so she would start the letter, Dear John. Don't sit under the apple. Remember, everybody cares in this. Don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me. Anyone else but me. Anyone else but me. No, no, no. Don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me till I come marching home. Oh, I just heard from a guy who heard from a guy next door to me. A girl he loves it, just loves to pet, and she fits it to a T. So don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me till I come marching home. And in a film, Betty Davis, of all people, sang, They're either too young or too old. They're either too gray or too grassy green. What's good is in the army. What's left will never harm me. Well, the British Isles were full of GIs building up training against the eventual invasion of Europe. And the British men complained about the Yanks. They said, the Yanks are overpaid, oversexed, and over here. <laughs> In the First World War, Irving Berlin wrote, Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I'd love to remain in bed. For the hardest blow of all is to hear that bugle call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up this morning. Someday I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday you're going to find him dead. I'll amputate his revelry and stomp upon it heavily and spend the rest of my days in bed. But I don't think you remember this first. I'll put my uniform away and move to Philadelphia and spend the rest of my days in bed. Well, in World War II, he wrote, this is the army, Mr. Jones. No private rooms or telephones. You had your breakfast in bed before, but you can't have it there anymore. This is the army, Mr. Green. Boom, boom, boom. We like a barracks nice and clean. You had a housemaid to sweep your floor, but she won't help you out anymore. Do what the bugler command. Da, 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 da. He's in the army and not in a van. So this is the army, Mr. Green. Uh, Mr. Brown. Brown. <laughs> you and your baby went to town. She had you worried, but this is war, and she won't worry you anymore. Well, in the spring of 1943, there was a strange sequence of events which occurred in my neighborhood, at my high school. I don't know if it happened anywhere else. One Sunday afternoon, my kid brother came running in the house crying. Those Nazi kids from Fifth and Army jumped me on the corner and beat me up. Well, everybody knew that the Fifth and Army neighborhood was a hotbed of Nazi sentiment. Everybody, including the FBI, knew that the German-American Bund, the Green American Nazi Party, met at the Rifle Club on Tabor Road. In school, we had heard just remarks. 
slurs being made. Well, as soon as I heard what had happened, I ran upstairs and grabbed my axe, which I just sharpened to go to Boy Scout camp. And I ran out. We were two blocks south of the boulevard. And I ran up towards the boulevard. My father stopped in to pick up Sam Lazarus, the cop on the block, who stopped to pick up his service revolver, and they were a block behind me. It's a good thing for me that I never could. <laughs> the next day we came into high school, to Alney High School, and there were swastikas chalked chalk, on most of the black the word went around school that Bernie Epstein, a teacher, had hit and knocked down another teacher who announced for everyone to hear that this was a Jewish war. When we were dismissed at 2.30, there were fistfights all around the school. I saw Moish Goldfield standing like this with four or five guys circling him, running and taking a slug at him. Finally, Pop Bechtel, the caretaker of the athletic field, came over and said, one at a time, make it a fair fight. I saw Tony Marhafka, the track coach, zoom by in his rumble seat flipper with several guys from the track team in it. And I found out later that one of the Jewish boys in the track team had also been jumped and beaten up, and they were trying to find the perpetrators. For two weeks after that, the Jewish kids at Omni walked to school in convoys, boys on the outside, girls on the inside. Two days later, Wednesday, was Boy Scout meeting night. The older boys, age 16, I was one of the older boys, escorted the younger boys home. On our street, there was an Arab family named Nasif. Three boys, part of our gang. The youngest one, dark complexion, tight curly hair. These Nazis thought he was Jewish, and they beat him up. The older Mesa boy, Nicky, was so strong that I once saw him walk around the block upside down on his hands. When we came back from escorting the younger boys home, we saw the remains of a Nazi raid on our neighborhood. And there was Nicky, his knees on the chest of one of these young Nazis his hands around his throat, banging his head against the curbstone. We pulled him off. We were afraid he was going to kill that boy. A couple of days later, the word went around that the Nazis had issued a challenge. There was going to be a war, a battle royal. They were going to come into our neighborhood in force, and we were going to fight it out. My father said to me, you're not going out. I said, Dad, I love you. I respect you. I've always tried to do everything you wanted me to do. I promise I won't take a weapon with me. But I just want to get my bare hands on one of those Nazi bastards. My father had been a bit of a brawler as a youngster himself. I said, okay. The neighborhood was packed with teenage boys and cops. They had gotten wind of it. And they never showed. We never found out what happened. But they backed down, and gradually everything faded out. We were never bothered again. And I used to wonder, why did this happen now? Why this sudden, sudden frenzied outburst 
of maybe it was frustration. Spring of 1943 was El Alamein. It was the first defeat of the Nazis. April 1943 was the beginning of the revolt in the Warsaw Ghetto. Not just for Britain, the Brits, but Jews were fighting back with guns. How humiliated they must have felt. And they wanted to take it. Well, servicemen, of course, had their own songs. They had parodies. You remember, in the First World War, we used to sing, Mademoiselle from Armentiers, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armentiers, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armentiers, she hasn't been kissed in 40 years. Hinky dinky, parlez-vous. Well, things were different now. We had women serving, so we sang, The waxen waves will win the war, parlez-vous. The waxen waves will win the war, parlez-vous. The waxen waves will win the war, so what the hell are we fighting for? Hinky dinky. They told me this was a mechanized war. Parlez-vous. They told me this was a mechanized war. Parlez-vous. They told me this was a mechanized war. So what the hell are we walking for? Hinky dinky parlez-vous. They took that old sentimental song. Those wedding bells are breaking up an old gang of mine. And they changed it to those mortar shells are breaking up at all. Okay. This was a whole category of songs. This was whistling in the dark. It was saying, I'm not afraid because you were quaking like hell inside. Early on, little flags began to appear in windows. About six by nine, one inch blue border, white field, and a star in the center. If it was a blue star, it meant you had someone serving in the armed forces. If it was a gold star, they had died in the service. So the servicemen sang things like this. Take down that service flag, mother. Replace it with one that is gold. Your son is a combat air crewman. He's dead when he's 18 years old. The Brits sang, kiss me good night, Sergeant Major. Tuck me into my wooden bed. And then we learned this one from them. Bless them all, bless them all. The long and the short and the tall. Bless all the corporals and AWO1s. Bless all the sergeants and their blessed sons. So we're saying goodbye to them all. As back in their billets they crawl. There'll be no promotion this side of the ocean. So cheer up my lads, bless them all. But the one song the British soldiers loved to sing most, you only know the melody of, and you've never heard the words. Probably. You know the melody because you heard them in the film, The Bridge on the River Kwai. Remember? Well, I'm not going to sing you the words. They are too filthy. <laughs> but just let it, let it suffice that they deprecate the testicular development of Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler, and Goering. Well, we had our own disparaging songs. Little boys used to sing, whistle while you work, Hitler is a jerk, Mussolini bit his weenie, now it doesn't work. <laughs> And Bing Crosby made a recording. This is why they called him Der Bingle. But I, I preferred the, the Spike Jones arrangement with all the whistles and bells and whoopee cushions. Then there are few horses, the Eastern Master Race, the Heil, Heil, 
hiding their pure space, not to love their pure heart is a great disgrace. So be high up, high up, hiding their pure space. Sometimes songwriters got inspiration from stories in the newspapers, human interest stories filed by war correspondents. In one, a chaplain, the GIs called them sky pilots, gave last rites to an anti-aircraft gunner aboard an aircraft carrier, and then took his place at the anti-aircraft gun. When he runs out of ammo, he calls out, praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Can afford to sit around the wishing. Praise the Lord, we're all creating perdition and the deep blue sea. Yes, the sky pilot said it, and you gotta give him credit for a son of a gun of a gunner was he. And another one, a crippled light bomber, was probably a, a Mitchell B-25 limped back to its base, one engine gone, it was a two-engine bomber, treetop level. And when he was being debriefed, the pilot said, boy, we came in on a wing and a prayer. Coming in on a wing and a prayer. Coming in. I was just turned 17 when I graduated high school. I enlisted in April of 1945. <coughs> the next month, the V-5 program, a Naval Aviation Officer Training Program opened up. I took the test and waited to be called there. I went on active duty July 1st. <coughs> the European War was already over. And I was prepared for a long war. In April, when I enlisted, the government was saying that they expected the war in Japan to last another four years. With me being in the service, with my younger brother about to start college, my parents figured they were going to be lonely. So they had another baby. <laughs> and a month and a half after I was in, the war in Japan ended. And I had a choice to make. I could stay in and get an engineering education, because basically that's what flight training is. The only way I could get out of the program was to flunk out, purposely. And that's what I did, because I'm an artist, not an engineer. I kept my English because I was writing. I kept my history because that was one of my interests. And the rest, I just spent the time at the library reading, starting my real education. So they sent me to Great Lakes Naval Training Station for a farce of a boot camp. Then I went to Shoemaker, California, where I caught a ship, 165 feet of fighting splinters. A seagoing tug, we sailed her up to Puget Sound, we decommissioned her, and then I had my choice. I could either do, as a lot of guys were doing, be paid what it's going to cost to take a train back to the East Coast to be discharged, or I could go on a troop train for six days. I chose to go on the troop train. It was quite an experience. And because of those extra six days, because I was discharged July 6th instead of July 1st, I became an official veteran of the Second <laughs> World War. I would never heard a shot fired in anger. <laughs> November 9th, 1946, 
the Aronson Kin, the Cousins Club of my father's family, held a dinner at the Belmont Plaza Hotel in New York. Aronsons from Philadelphia, Harrisburg, Washington, D.C., New York, Boston, where we gave thanks for the safe return of our 14 servicemen and women, ranging in rank from the major to senior first class. <laughs> in the years that followed, the fate of the Rubelsky family in Kiev, Ukraine, and the Aronson family in Kovna, Lithuania, became clear to me, if only by indirection. I remember as a child that Grandpa Luby used to receive letter, postcards in Yiddish from his older sister in Kiev. As I started to read the history of the Holocaust, I learned about the mass shooting of tens of thousands of Jews from Kiev at the ravine called Babi Yar, in the outskirts of Kiev. And I understood that that is why the postcard stopped coming in December of 1941. And then once Grandpa Berenson kind of let slip that he was sending money to a cousin to help support him as he was trying to become established in Israel. And I understood that he was the sole survivor of a very large family. And I realized what I knew subconsciously all of this time, that I had more than one reason for enlisting in World War II.